ready to go now? Are y'all ready to worship? Amen. All right, here we go. Who oh, are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Praise the Lord. Aren't you glad you've seen it? Seen the light. Praise the Lord. We're going to receive our tithes and offerings tonight. Thank you for your faithfulness. Now, if you were here for the business meeting, you saw how much the Lord had blessed us over and abundant. And uh, so we are grateful not only for his faithfulness, but for yours. Thank you for giving to our church. Father, we thank you tonight for your goodness. We acknowledge it's your hand of blessing that has rested upon us for this past year. God, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for giving us wisdom and direction. We thank you, Father, for the generous hearts that you've gathered together in this place. We ask for your blessing to rest upon their homes, Father, and upon their finances. God, that you would continue to guide us and direct us in the resources that you've given us, Father. We ask that you bless the seed and the sower tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Your love is amazing, steady and unchanging. Your love is a mountain firm beneath my feet. Your love is a mystery, how you gently lift me. When I am surrounded, your love carries me. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Your love makes me sing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, your love makes me sing. Your love is surprising, I can feel it rising. All the joy that's growing deep inside of me. Every time I see you, all your goodness shines through. I can feel this God song rising up in me. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, your love makes me sing. Hallelujah, 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 your love makes me sing. Your love is amazing, steady and unchanging. Your love is a mountain firm beneath my feet. Your love is a mystery, how you gently lift me. When I am surrounded, your love carries me. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Your love makes me sing. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Your love makes me sing. When I cannot feel, when my wounds don't heal, Lord, I humbly kneel, hidden in you. Lord, you are my life, so I don't mind to die. Just the 
as long as I'm hidden in you. If I could just sit with you a while, if you could just hold me, nothing could touch me, though I If I could just sit with you a while, I need you to hold me moment by moment till forever passes by. When I know I've sinned, when I should have been crying out, my God, and hidden in you. Lord, I need you now more than I know how. So I humbly bow, hidden in you. If I could just sit with you a while, if you could just hold me, nothing could touch me, though I'm wounded, though I die. If I could just sit with you a while, I need you to hold me moment by moment till forever passes by. If I could just sit with you a while, if you could just hold me, nothing could touch me. Though I'm wounded, though I die, if I could just sit with you a while, I need you to hold me moment by moment till forever passes by. Moment by moment, till forever passes by. Moment by moment, till forever passes sing about our healer amen well you hold my every moment and you calm my raging sea you walk with me through fire and heal all my disease Lord I trust I trust in you I trust in you tell it church oh I believe you're my healer I believe you I believe 
you're my portion and i believe you're more than enough for me jesus you're all i need well nothing is impossible for you nothing is impossible nothing is impossible for you you hold my world in your hands nothing is impossible for you nothing is impossible oh nothing is impossible for you you hold my world in your hand I I believe you're my portion. And I believe you're more than enough for me. Jesus, you're all I need. Yes, Lord, you're all that we our everything. Oh, we fall down, we lay our crown at the feet of Jesus. The greatness of mercy and love at the feet Sing out loud to him here. We cry, holy, holy, holy. Yes, Lord, you are holy, holy, holy. We cry, holy, holy, holy. You're so holy, Father. Oh, we fall down, we lay our crown at the feet of Jesus. The greatness of mercy and love at the feet of Jesus, we Again, I 
Father, we thank you for your faithfulness even in the midst of chaos. 
of transition, Father, you are faithful. Father, you're worthy of praise even in the middle of the storm. You're worthy of worship even when there's trials. You are faithful, O God, and we thank you for your goodness. Father, we ask for your anointing tonight. God, we thank you for the individuals that are serving with our kids. We ask, God, that for your anointing to rest upon them, that, Father, their hearts would be receptive and open to what you have. And I pray, Father, tonight that our hearts and our ears would be open to what you have. God, I thank you for the goodness that you give us. I thank you, Father, for your word. It is sharp, and it will accomplish your purpose. It will not return to you, void God. Accomplish your purpose tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for worshiping. Amen. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. If you want to go to 2 Chronicles chapter 7, we're going to be talking about successful praying tonight. Successful praying. How many of you want your prayers to be unsuccessful? Right? That defeats the whole purpose, right? The Bible talks about vain repetitions. That's not what we want to do. We want to get in, take care of it, and let the Lord handle it. Amen? Amen. Second Chronicles chapter 7. We're going to begin in verses 11 and go through verse 14. If you would, would you stand with me as we read the Word of God? We believe that it is sharp and it will accomplish His purpose, that He will watch over it and cause it to come to pass. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 11 says, Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the king's house. And Solomon successfully accomplished all that came into his heart to make in the house of the Lord and in his own house. Then the Lord prepared Solomon, excuse me, the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I have heard your prayer. You have chosen and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. And when I shut up heaven and there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and heal their land. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your promise. Father, we know that you do not say what you do not mean. And so, God, we thank you for your faithfulness tonight. We thank you for your word and the promise that we have to stand upon. We ask, God, that you would give us a revelation, understanding of what you desire in prayer and how, Father, to accomplish what your heart is when we seek your face. Thank you for tonight, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Glory to God. All right, so Second Chronicles chapter 7, we, it was used for the National Day of Prayer. And uh, it's used often when we go to seek God for our nation. Uh, we have sign up in the back for days uh, to pray for our nation, to ask God for revival, to ask God to turn the direction of our nation, to uh, ask God to direct our leaders. And um, we, don't, we don't believe that we serve a God that is unable or unwilling to change the direction of our nation. I believe his heart is for the people of the United States to humble themselves and seek him, and he will heal our land. If, if any land is broken, I would say that our land has been. The last few years have been very tumultuous, very chaotic. Things are just unreasonable and out of character. But I believe that we serve a God that can change the situation. In fact, that's the very prayer that is prayed here. If you go back to chapter 6 in Second Chronicles, you can read a pretty impressive prayer by Solomon. He begins to pray. They, they've just finished the temple. David wanted to build a temple, but God didn't let him. So Solomon built the temple, but David set aside articles and materials for the building of the temple. Solomon builds the temple, and it's finally finished, and it's dedicated. And so, so then Solomon goes and asks God that he would put his name in that place, that he would honor that place because it's dedicated to him. And God answers him in this place, and he says, it's interesting because if you go through and you look at Solomon's prayer, Solomon is asking God to preserve that place so that when Israel rebels, there'll be a place that they can pray and God will hear them. God's 
uh, Solomon is actually asking God, God, even when the people rebel, will you hear them when they pray to this place and they are repentant before you? Would you hear them? And it's interesting that Solomon's desire is that even when Israel rebels, because he knows how people are, he says, even when they mess up God, when they turn back to you, will you hear them? Will you, will you come and meet with them? And will you, will you reestablish that relationship with them? And so God answers here in, in verse 12. He says, I heard your prayer, Solomon. And he says, for your sake, I will hear when they come to me. I will hear when they call upon my name. I will answer their request when they come to me. And that's a beautiful, beautiful encouragement when you wonder, does God still want me? Can God still use me? Is there something that God can still get out of me that's useful? God says, I will hear and I will answer if you'll come to me. And so God is answering Solomon's prayer. With all that time, now if you think about it, there's been two generations worth of investment in that temple. You have David's, David's and you have Solomon's. And God says, I've chosen this place to put my name. Now, I think it's interesting that he says uh, in, in verse 12, I've heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself. Notice this, as a house of sacrifice. It's a place of dying, a place of death, a place of the shedding of blood. How many know when you come into God's house and you enter into his presence, you have to give up some stuff. You have to release that worldly nature and say, God, I want you. It's a place of sacrifice. And so he says, this is a house of sacrifice. And he says, now listen. And I was, I was looking at this and I was thinking about our current situation. Donnie, you still awake? Okay, all right. Donnie said I had to keep him awake tonight, so I'll just check him. Okay. Now look at this. He says, when I shut up heaven and there is no rain. Now I know this past week or two we've had some rain, right? But before that... Right? We went a long time. I've talked to a few ranchers and a few farmers that were like, ain't no rain. Right? And I, I talked to one farmer in Plains, and he said, I can keep it alive, but only God can make it grow. <laughs> he said, God just does a better job than we do. But he says, when there's no rain, and I would say that's our situation. Then he says, or command the locusts to devour the land. I, I, I shared a couple weeks ago. That the news, I don't know if it's Fox News or one of the other news channels, had said that the 17 year locusts are coming out in Washington, D.C. And I thought, wow, plague, right? So he says, when the locusts devour the land, well, we got locusts, we got, uh, we got uh, no rain. And then the last one is pestilence, right? We've got our children's pastor and our Royal Ranger commander quarantined, right? Because of this dreaded COVID, right, that nobody wants. He says, when these things happen, he says, if my people, not the heathen, not the rebellious, not those that have not committed their life to God, but if the people who have committed their heart to Jesus Christ, those that have decided to follow Christ, those that have decided to give themselves to God, if they will humble themselves, Pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear. Sometimes I think we take for granted and we assume that because God knows everything, we don't have to ask. Did you know that you're supposed to ask? You know, there, there were times when I didn't want to ask. And I, I either didn't want to, you know, you, you're sitting there and there's, there's a piece of cake left, and you, you're like, wow, I would really like to have that cake. Or you're really thirsty, but you don't want to bother the person to ask for a drink. God said, I want my people to ask. Just because I know doesn't mean I don't want them to ask. But sometimes we, we take for granted the fact that God knows, and so he's going to take care of it. But here he says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. So what are the steps to a successful prayer? God says, we, we look at that and we say, yes, we want, our, we want to be forgiven. And yes, we want our land healed. But what steps do we have to take? Not that we're earning it, but God has said, this is, there's some procedure that goes with this. And so what are those? And so remember, he's talking to God's people now when, when he's talking to this. The first step is to humble ourselves. Isn't that exciting? 
How many of you like to humble yourself? Anybody like to be embarrassed or humbled? Okay, I didn't think so. Now, remember, we're talking about God's people humbling themselves. That, that uh, Hebrew word is a root, and it says, to bend the knee, hence to humiliate or vanquish, to bring down low, into subjection, under, or humble oneself, or to subdue, and I'm going to add in there, our ego. Sometimes we have to get our ego out of the way. I, I remember working on a plumbing project, and I was, I was sure that I could take care of it. You ever been there and had those projects? Well, I got this. I got this. And it was, it was really simple. It should have been really simple. And I, I was working on it, and, and I glued, and it didn't stay glued. And then I glued again, and it didn't stay glued again. Or I glued one side, and the other side popped out. You know, kind of one of those deals, you know, you think you're making progress, and you take two steps back. I was getting really, really frustrated. I'm like, this should not be this hard. And then you had this still, small voice that said, hey, why don't you ask for some help? Oh. And so I actually humbled myself. And ask my little brother, my younger brother, I should say. He's 6'3", but my younger brother for help. And he was like, oh, yeah, I'd be glad to. He came over, and within five minutes, we had it fixed. But I had to humble myself and ask for help. God said the first step to a successful prayer is to remember that who it is that we need help from. It's not us. It's not our strength. It's not our intellect. It's not our resources. It is our God. It is our God that we look to for help. And if we think we can handle it without Him, then we are mistaken. And so our first step when, when things are going wrong is to humble ourselves and say, God, I need you. I need you in this place. Yes, it may be a simple project, God. Or maybe it's a huge project. But typically with a huge project, we're going to ask for God's help. But it's that, I'm just going to the store, God. It's not that big a deal, God. You can worry about somebody else. But if we humble ourselves, then that is when God reacts. We can't come in arrogance or ego. We can't disrespect who He is. But when we come with humbleness, when we realize that we don't deserve forgiveness... But we are approaching the throne with a healthy respect for the Lord God Almighty. We may not think that we have pride. But the very fact that we have not asked God to be included. Means that we have taken upon ourselves a certain amount of ego. And saying, I can handle this God. But when we humble ourselves, Then he begins to move. James chapter 4 verse 6 says, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. It's not about climbing that ladder. It's about bowing that knee and letting him lift you to that place. In fact, James chapter 4, verses 6 through 10 sounds a lot like 2 Chronicles chapter 7, 14. It's just in the New Testament. But when we humble ourselves and acknowledge our need, that's step number one to a successful prayer. Step number two is to actually pray. And I mentioned this, I alluded to this a little earlier. It seems that sometimes Christians mistakenly mistake complaining for praying oh god i'm so tired oh god this problem is so big oh god i'm so short of money oh god i don't know what to do but they're not actually asking for his help they're just complaining anybody been there <laughs> we can go through the list of wines but do we actually ask him to get involved we have to ask we have to actually pray also, sometimes Christians just assume, as I said before, that God knows, and so he's going to take care of it if they whine enough. Listen, God didn't say, if you come to me and humble yourself and whine to me, he said, if you pray to me, 
get in, ask me to get involved. For whatever reason, God has asked us to pray for our needs even though he knows about them. He still requires that we ask him for our needs. It may seem redundant, but scripture is full of instances where God and Jesus ask what people wanted. God didn't assume or just do it. He waited for them to ask. It, have you ever noticed Jesus? He would go up to people that had an obvious problem and say, what do you want me to do for you? If they were blind, he would still ask them, what is it you want? And they would tell him, I want my sight. Listen, sometimes we assume that just because God knows what we need, we don't have to ask. Listen, it's okay to ask. Yes, he knows about it, but he wants you to humble yourself and come to him and make that petition so that we acknowledge that we need him. And so um, I've got an example in uh, John chapter 5, verse 6. There's a man that's been there, I think it's like for 38 years. He's been there a long time. So let's read John chapter 5, verse 6. When Jesus saw him lying there, and knew that he had already been there in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? And we would think, well, of course he does. He wouldn't be sitting at the pool if he didn't, right? Yet Jesus asked to him, you've been sitting here a long time. Are you comfortable with the way things are? Or do you still want to be healed? And see, we take that for granted. Yet Jesus asked the question to the guy. And we would say, well, yeah. Don't take for granted that just because God knows your situation, have you invited him into it? Have you asked him to be involved? Have you asked him to give you direction or guidance or send labors across the path of the person that needs that? And just so you know, here's an example of a word of knowledge. Jesus operated as... As he was anointed by the Holy Spirit, it says that Jesus knew that he'd been there a long time. Well, how did he know? Well, the Holy Spirit revealed it to him. And listen, here's the problem. Sometimes we get used to our problems, and so we just say, well, that's just the way it is. And we leave it. It's kind of like that dripping faucet. Well, it's just dripped for years. Well, how many gallons of water have you lost? Right? How much crud has built up on it? Jesus wanted to know, are you okay with status quo? Or do you want something to change? Listen, don't come to God if you're happy with the things, way things are. You come to God when you're ready for something to change. Because you're not going to humble yourself unless you want something to change. So when we pray for our nation, are we just saying words because the pastors ask us to? Or do we want the God that we serve to make a difference in this nation? Are we wanting God to change our leaders, to change their hearts, for revival to break out in Washington, D.C.? You talk about a miracle right there. Get Washington, D.C. to be swept by revival? Whew, man, that would be right up there with the parting of the Red Seas and the fire from heaven for Elijah, right? But that's the God that we serve. So he said we're to ask. The Hebrew word there to pray is to judge Officially or mentally, by extension, to intercede or pray, to entreat. And here's an interesting word. It says judgment. When we pray, we make a judgment. It's like God says, what is it you want? Make a decision. Ask me specifically for what you want. Don't just come and whine. Tell me, what is it you want? Make a judgment. Make a decision. What is it you want me to do? And then petition me for it. James chapter 1, verse 6. <clears throat> it says, But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like the wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. See, Jesus wants us to ask with confidence, not only in what he can do, but what we have said. We need to stake it in the ground and say, God, this is what I want. God's not afraid of us. He's not afraid of us saying, God, this specific situation is what I want you to deal with. Because if we are tossed, if we're not, well, God, I want you to do that, but, you know, I'm not sure. And, God, I know you can, but I don't know if you want to. Um, well, here's the result if we ask with doubt. James 1.7 says, 
For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. It's kind of like, um, <laughs> have you ever gotten a text and it was like, what is it they're really saying? You know, you, you, it wasn't clear what they wanted. God is saying, look, if, if you're not specific, if you're not sure what you know what you want, you're not going to get it. Be confident when you come to me. Let me know what you want. Listen, unless you're asking for something that's contrary to his will, right, you can have confidence. Unless your heart condemns you, you can have confidence with God. So when you come to him, be specific. Be specific. Now, I, I, I got you. There's sometimes when the, the need that you have is so overwhelming, it's just, it's just too much to try to put into words. I'm not talking about that situation. Okay? I believe God hears the cry of our heart. And that's what a prayer is, is the cry of the heart. When, when Abraham was interceding for Sodom and Gomorrah, he wasn't really interceding for Sodom and Gomorrah. He was interceding for his nephew, Lot. Because he knew Lot was in that town. And his heart's cry was for Lot to be saved. And he said, well, what if there's 50? What if there's 40? What if there's 30? Worked him down to 10. But Abraham never said, will you deliver Lot? He just said, don't destroy the city. Well, they went in. There wasn't 10 people. But guess who got saved? Lot. Why? Because God heard that heart's cry. That's what Abraham really wanted. But he didn't say it specifically. So don't be afraid to ask for specifics. There's also this interesting phrase there about seek my face. If you will pray and seek my face. It's interesting, that is a plural phrase that's always used as a singular text. Not, to me, that just kind of reminded me of the Trinity. A plural form used as singular, that's the Trinity. He said, seek my face. Solomon's prayer mentions, if you go back to chapter 6, God's anointing, turning his face away from Israel. That was Solomon's concern. God, don't ever take... And look away from us. Don't ever take your gaze off of us. God, we want to be what you're looking at. In 2 Chronicles chapter 6, verse 42, notice what Solomon's prayer is. O oh God, do not turn away the face of your anointed. Remember the mercies of your servant David. You know, sometimes I have this tendency, when I get in an argument, I'm like, I'm done. You ever been there? I'm not going to carry on this conversation anymore. I just don't want to look at you anymore. Solomon's prayer is, God, don't ever get to the point where you turn your back on us. I, I want to stay in your face. So when God says, seek my face, that means if he begins to turn because of our wickedness and we begins to turn away, he says, God, I want to get in your vision. I want to get up in your face. I want, I want to know that you're looking at me. I want to stay in your vision. I don't, I don't want you to focus on someone else. I want your attention. I want to be what you, where you want me to be. He says, please don't ignore us. Even when we've rebelled, let us again catch your eye. Please look our way. Let us be seen. We will even move to get back into your view. And that's the heart's cry. It's to get back to where we're supposed to be. Because step number three, we're supposed to humble ourselves. we're supposed to ask, and then there's supposed to be action. We're supposed to turn from our wicked ways. Now remember, he's talking, he's talking to God's people. We think, well, God's people aren't wicked. Listen, we can choose to do wicked things. And sometimes we think, well, wicked, that's kind of a harsh word. Listen, sin is wicked in God's eyes. Now, is he merciful? Absolutely. This is not condemnation. But we need to understand that when we step out of God's will, it's sin. And sin is, a de is detestable before God. It's not something that we can just play off. Oh, well, it wasn't that big a deal. Listen, sin is what will cause him to bring judgment. And that's not what he wants to do. He wants to love on us. But it means that we have to come to him and acknowledge that what we've done is sin. Not just, well, I messed up. No, no. We sinned. That's that humbleness of acknowledging what we have done. But when we do that, we trigger the mercies of God. He said, don't turn your face away from us. Remember your mercies. 
when we come to him and we acknowledge that what we've done is sin, there, there is not a harshness in him. There is mercy. There is this, I want you back. You, you have acknowledged that what you've done is wrong, and so he embraces us. He doesn't push us away because of what we've done. When we come to him, he embraces us. And that's why we should not fear coming to him and acknowledging that what we've done is sin. Because his goal is not to drive us away, but to bring us close. But until we acknowledge that what we've done is sin, he waits and he lets those consequences happen so that we acknowledge that what we've done is wrong. Repentance is more than just remorse that we, we got caught. Repentance is a change of mind because when you change your mind, your actions will follow. But it starts with your decision. Transforming our mind will change our actions. It's a choice. It's a choice to take control away from the flesh and give it back to our spirit. Because when we sin, we choose to follow the flesh. When we get in that argument and we hold a grudge, or when we, when we watch that thing on TV that we know the Spirit has convicted us of, and, they, and there's that sin on the TV that we, we put in front of our eyes, that's sin. But when we confess it, when we honor it to God, and we say, yes, God, that was wrong, that was bad, I was sinful, and I'm sorry. That's it. He embraces us and brings us back. It is a choice and remember, he's talking to God's people about wickedness. Not the heathen, not the, not the outsiders, God's people. They have to acknowledge the wickedness. But here's the good news. When, when we acknowledge sin, we trigger the mercy of God. When we humble ourselves and we acknowledge that, then God begins that transforming process of bringing us back home. See, it is God's view that counts. It's not our biased opinion or our slanted view. God is quick to forgive, but we have to confess that what we've done is wrong. Even the prodigal son acknowledged that his actions were sinful. But as soon as he did, the father called for the ring and the robe. The father ran to the son when he returned, but the father allowed him to confess his sin. I think sometimes we act too quick. When somebody begins to cry and weep for the sin that they have committed, they need to acknowledge that that sin, and we can embrace them. Notice, the father ran to the son. As soon as he turned around to come home, the father ran to him and kissed him. That's that touch of that Holy Spirit. When he gets the kiss, that conviction of the Holy Spirit comes on him, and he says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. And he was going to go on, but at that point, the father interrupts him and says, Whoa, receive my mercy. Look at this. Luke chapter 15, verse 20. <clears throat> Luke chapter 15, verse 20 says, And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him. God's looking. And he had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and am no longer worthy to be called your son. That's that humbleness. But notice, but the father. Everybody say, but. Everybody say, but. Okay? We have a plan, but God. He says, but the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe. Not the hand-me-down. The best robe. And put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. And bring the fatted calf here and kill it. Let us eat and be merry. Was there wallowing in pity? Was there guilt and shame? No. As soon as the son confessed, as soon as he acknowledged his sin, what did the father do? He covered him. He covered him with that robe of righteousness. And he said, hey, bring the best robe. He said, bring that ring of sonship. He just said, his plan, if you go back and you look at it, the son planned on being a slave. He said, I'll just work as a slave. He said, no. Sorry, you're coming back as a son. Full restoration to sonship. He had the ring that acknowledged the family. He was a part of the family. He didn't have to spend two weeks feeling miserable about what he'd done. He didn't have to wallow in his guilt and shame. When he confessed, 
he was set free. That's what happens when we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Listen, if you try to feel worthy of his forgiveness, you're missing the point. We're not. But when we, can, when we humble ourselves, when we ask for forgiveness and we confess our sin, he is faithful to restore us to sonship. That son, once that ring was put on, had the authority that he had lost when he had gone away. But he was restored to that sonship, and they began to rejoice and be merry. While we must acknowledge our sin, we don't have to dwell on it. Once confession is made, we don't have to wallow in guilt and shame. That is what Jesus bore for us. What did he bear? He bore our guilt and shame. He bore the ridicule of the world. They made fun of him on the cross. Why? Because he was dealing with the consequences of sin. Jesus took care of that for us. We don't have to wallow in self-pity. We don't have to feel unworthy for two weeks before. We, we don't have to pay penance. That's what Jesus did. We walk in sonship. Now listen, does it make sense to our mind? No, you know, I should feel bad about this because that's what the world tells us we should do. We should have to earn our feeling of restoration. It's all about Him and what He accomplished on the cross. Now, listen, please don't mistake. We still have to acknowledge it as sin and we still have to repent of it. But when we do, the Father embraces us and stops us and says, all right, you're back. Let's party. That's the joy of confessing our sins. Last verse, 1 John 1, 6 through 9. 1 John chapter 1, 6 through 9. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, notice that's an if, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The end. Our record is clear. Jesus has paid the price. We're restored to relationship. That's the joy. Once that relationship is restored, then when we ask the Father for something, listen, He already gave the fatted calf for the prodigal son, right? The son didn't even have to ask for it. When we ask, when we've been restored to sonship, and we ask, hey, God, I have this situation with my parents, or I have this situation with my grandson. grandson. When we ask, if he's already given Jesus for us, is there anything that he'll withhold from us when our heart's in that good relationship? Listen, I, I have some experience with my father and my kids. If they ask, it doesn't matter. Grandpa's going to make it happen, right? We return that sonship. That's the joy of repentance and coming back to God because it restores that relationship and the beauty is restored. So tonight, don't let the enemy tell you that you have to feel bad for three weeks before you're worthy of forgiveness. When you confess your sins, he is faithful. And he will keep his word. That's his promise. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your goodness. God, I thank you for the reminder, God, that if we sin, if we commit sin before you, God, it is not the end of the line that when we humble ourselves and we seek your face, and we pray, and we ask for your forgiveness, you are faithful to forgive and restore. And God, I thank you, Father, for the blessings that you have placed upon this land and upon this church. I thank you, Father, for your goodness. And God, I pray, Lord, that we would humble ourselves before you, God, that we would seek your face. And Father, for us, if there is any wicked way in us, that God, you would convict us, convict us of it, that, God, you would show us our wickedness, that you would show us our rebellion, and that, Father, we would be quick to turn, quick to repent, Father, because your forgiveness is waiting, your cleansing is waiting, that restored relationship is waiting for us, just like the Father waited for the prodigal. So tonight, God, I pray, Lord, for restored relationship. 
I pray, Father, for our nation, that, Father, our nation would humble itself before you. God, that the revival would hit our country, God. And that, Father, our eyes would turn to you, God, and that we would repent of our wicked ways. And that, Father, we would turn to you and ask for your healing and your touch. We would ask for your forgiveness, God. I thank you for your faithfulness, God. Though men may fail, you are faithful. God, encourage your people tonight. Encourage them, Father, to seek your face. To know, Father, that we can be successful in our prayers when we're in right standing with you. I thank you for it, God. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Be blessed. Have a great week. Don't forget, we're worshiping and praising on Sunday.